given you up to this time I haven't used the boundedness of T at T and the linearity of T. Okay, so I've used hypothesis and everything, but I haven't used the boundedness. So since T is bounded, now uh, I can write, maybe give the final stroke, that since T is bounded, so I can have this. So the Tf can be equal to, so it's like a T times of n equal to 1 to infinity fn, okay, and q raised to n minus 1, okay. So since, so it's like I can write this sum as limit n goes to infinity of partial sums and I can exchange the limit and that t, in other words, since t is bounded, I can take this t inside the sum actually. So this would be 1. So n equal to 1 to infinity, q raised to n minus 1 and I'm going to have tfn. Okay? Linearity as well. So if this is the case, what's going to happen? Norm apply to the norm. So, there's no need to apply the norm. Plus Q raised to N minus 1 and GK. And this is equal to what? G. This is equal to your G at. Think about it. Because that's what we prove that this converges to G. The inequality is So we yes, construct it somehow, and F, I'll kind of have we found the pre image for the G at, which is F. Okay, so I think you missed then the very fundamental point. 
So we said that, okay, so, so that's a good point. Let me repeat it again. So I'm saying that take an arbitrary g for which I can find f for which this is true, okay. So I'm saying that when, so arbitrary g, g can be of three forms actually. Number one, it could be zero, okay, it could have a norm less than or equal to one, or it could have a norm greater than or equal to one, or maybe not less than or equal to one, okay. So I'm saying that if g is zero, then the uh, proposition is trivial. What we have just proved is for g norm of less than, uh, 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 whose norm is less than or equal to one. But for a generic g, okay, whose norm is not less than or equal to one, I can force that g to satisfy such an inequality by doing what? Just normalizing it actually. Just normalize. So if you take a generic G, if you take a generic G, I'm going to turn it into an H which is, you know, G, okay, so the G norm of G, okay, so it's like G, H is G over norm of G, okay, and now the norm of this H is going to be less than or equal to 1. And I can play this whole game for this H. And for, for this H, this inequality is also going to be true. Okay? Without norm of G. Because the norm of H is less than or equal to 1. But, is, but, but what is norm of H actually? If I substitute it here. So it's going to be norm of F, uh, norm of okay, uh, G less than or equal to. Okay? So it's not, I'm not going to have an F here, but I'm going to have g divided by the norm of g. Okay, so it's like g divided by the norm of g. So in other words, this inequality is going to trivially come actually if you if you if you you know do it for the, those g's for which the norm is less than or equal to one. So therefore, I, I began the proof with that you know it is sufficient to show for those g's for which the norm is less than or equal to one. There is no need to consider the generic case because the generic case follows from it by just normalizing it. Okay? So have to be a bit more careful. Is it making sense? So we have this beautiful result with us and now we are in position to claim the proof for <coughs> the open open. Sure. Okay, that's what we can we can do. Alright, sir. The only sequence construct is the one f in the norm space. The g was or j jump is the f e in the norm space. So, मतलब उसकी convergence से ये convergence हमें मिलेगा. हाँ, ये वो वाम लीड इट अगेन. This is not difficult. You can keep it as like in the story, and you see that how clever this proof is actually. It's a very clever proof. All right. So I'm not getting rid of this. I'm just getting rid of this part. And the statement of I think it's the statement of open map, mapping theorem with me. And then I'd like to write a quick proof for open mapping theorem. Okay? So let's quickly recall what the open mapping theorem is telling me. So the open mapping theorem is telling me that imagine I have two Banach spaces and T is a linear bounded map that is subjective. Okay? Then for every G in F, I can find a pre-image, okay, uh, such that, you know, G is pre-image of F, and, uh, you know, F and, the size of F and G are somehow related with, you know, this inequality, and related through this inequality, okay. So, what I'm going to do essentially, I'm going to do that given this situation, I would say that this hypothesis is satisfied. 
this hypothesis is satisfied. And if this hypothesis is satisfied, we are done. So the theorem is giving us the conclusion that we want actually. Okay? Just treat this whole quantity as a thing. Q goes zero to Q goes zero to this. Maybe you know you just need a number. Very big constant. Okay. Is it making sense? That's that's what is my strategy. So so let's begin quickly. Proof of map theorem. If I, as I said to you, that I can, you can also see actually this as the open, open what are the open maps actually? Open centers. So it's like these are the kind of maps, okay, which maps open sets onto them. Open sets. So that's what I would like to show up. So, so this condition is just reformulation of you know. Approximately subjective to hoja hai, to the subjective hai, to go more than that. To go subjective hai, to approximately hoja hai. Okay. And as I said, we need to also keep in hand that we claim that open map theorem is a consequence of bare theorem. So we haven't used the bare theorem. So there must be some rule of bare theorem as well. Okay. So here's the proof. So what is given to me? Given to me is a T which is linear and bounded. Okay. And it's surjective. Linear bounded. And Reflect, reflect upon it. What does it mean? So I'm saying that. So it's like it comprises of those G's for which the, we can find pre images actually. And these okay. ones. For which we can find pre images. In all E. But if F is in E, so the norm of F must be finite actually. So if it is finite, it must be less than or equal to some natural number. Sir, it's the uh, range of a closed ball like this. Precisely, that's what about <laughs> precisely that I was, I was about to write that this is nothing, but that's a range of uh, so like a consider a ball, okay, L E with the center origin, okay, and radius N. Okay. So it's a range of a closed ball. Okay. Is it making sense? Something for you to verify, you're not gonna do it, that this Bn is midpoint convex. I hope you remember what's the midpoint convexity. So it's like you take any two elements from here, their average is also here. Okay? It's midpoint convex 
and symmetry making. And symmetry. And here is something pretty interesting. F is the union of all these balls. Why is the case? Conclusion of the theorem. Then are equal to some natural number actually. It is going to be always a natural number. So in other words, that element is going to belong to one of these the ends actually. Are you getting the point? So keep, keep in view this. Next, in other words, I can write this as union. And 
this fact that f is union of n belongs to n uh, the n we have we have what we have f equal vector union of n belongs to n a n agree so I can replace now these bs by ans why this would be the case so see there was a trouble I, I can't so, so, so I can't apply the Baer's theorem here because I don't know about the bns that what they are but I can, I can apply Baer's theorem now because I know that F can be written as F it is written as the union of closed ball side. Okay? Can you see this why this follows from the surjectivity of the F? F is the bound of the space. something to it. Just go back and okay, open your books on topology and see the characterizations. So we did the several characterizations of continuity. Okay? We did several characterizations of continuity. Okay? You also keep in, in hand that okay, this Bn is a T of this actor. So, okay. <laughs> So if I take the closure of this, then this is same as the closure of this. But this T is continuous. So do we inside have closure, something? inside closure. Huh? Closure will be. Yes. So I would say that this is contained in of what? T of closure of what? T of a whole closure. So if, was it was it? This contained in this or other way around? What was the case? Other way around, sir. Other way around. This is. Are you sure? <coughs> no. Yes, I do. Maybe a good, ex good, good effort, again, exercise to open your previous books and just see the continuity and see this. Yes, sir. Okay. Maybe something to verify. At least we need to keep record of the basic results. Okay, so let's summarize what we have done so far. So we said that T is linear bounded and subjective and we are saying that Bns are the collection of those Fs for which you can find pre images but the pre image has a norm less than or equal to what? N and then you know something to verify that Bn is midpoint convex and symmetric. If this is the case then its closures are also midpoint, you know, convex and symmetric. And I can also write that this F is the union of these closures actually. So there are two facts at least that we must verify along with an exercise. So this point, you know, this part needs a rigor actually. So it needs more justification. So I'm leaving it for you to fill out. Okay? What I would like to do next? So don't forget that where we want to be. I want to be in the business of this theorem. Maybe eleven. That's what my key, what do you call intention is. Because if the assumptions of this lemma are satisfied, you get what you want. Okay? Can we say about ANs that all ANs are closed? Because they are closures. And their union is giving you F. Which is true. So I am in, I'm in the business of Baer's theorem. So by Baer's theorem, 
what does the Bayer's theorem tell us? That there exists an n, maybe a fixed n, there exists a fixed n in n such that that contains an open ball. fixed n such that a n contains an open somewhere, okay, maybe some h and the radius r and contained in a n Okay. Now for a n what we know something interesting that its midpoint convex n and symmetric actually. Then I, what can I do? I can translate this ball and the region. Okay, so that's what we did result in a last class that if you have a set which is midpoint convex and symmetric and it contains an open ball then at, at an arbitrary point okay then you can somehow translate that ball and place it at zero as a center actually okay Okay. And hence, and hence, I can place this f. There are lots of typos in this books here. You know, there are lots of typos. So be careful when you are reading it, because for the same ball, you know, sometimes you write f and sometimes you write e actually. The ball must be obviously f actually. Okay. So what can I do? I can. Okay. I can have a closed ball f with the radius r contained in a n actually. Agree? Yes. Alright. But the a n is what? A n is the cl closure of b n. And a n is, I cannot also write that a n is the closure of the ball in E centered at zero with the radius m actually. Agree? Maybe a closed ball. Agree? Yes. Okay. So, so I, I can I can say actually that, and maybe I can write more precisely, that this is true. T of, so T of BE to N is contained in. Okay. We are defining BE as an array of open bar, B of open bar of BE. It's not an open ball, it must be a closed ball. If I have written, I have written it wrong. It must be a closed ball. Okay. It must be a closed ball. And I, and I think when I uttered the words, I said closed ball. I didn't say open ball. Okay. So don't believe what I write actually. So you might you know, believe what I say sometimes. Not always. <laughs> Not always. Okay? Now, here's the last step. If I divide both sides by R and try to interpret what does it mean by dividing both sides by R Each element of this actually. Okay? 
the norms of the so, so this means on dividing both sides by r, dividing both sides and by dividing, you know, what it covers. Multiply by one over r. Okay. 